when Judy Anderson did not appear for work on the morning of the 26th of December 2007. Her friend and co-worker immediately felt that something was off, so she drove to the Anderson family home to check on her friend. But once she arrived, Linda stumbled upon a completely horrific scene. 911. Uh, there's been a murder. There's three people dead that I can see right now. Inside? I just came up. She works with me. Inside the house? Yes. What do you see? There's a baby and a man and a woman, and she's my best friend. As Linda entered the home, she found the body of Scott Anderson, Judy's son, along with Scott's wife and their two young children behind the house. Her friend Judy Anderson was lying next to her husband Wayne and they were both dead. Who had murdered this whole family so heartlessly? And where was Judy's other daughter, Michelle Anderson? Was she also dead or was she the one who had committed this horrible crime? This is the horrific story of the Anderson family Christmas massacre. Sixty-year-old Wayne Anderson was a Boeing engineer and he had been happily married to his wife, 61-year-old US Postal Service worker Judy Anderson for 31 years. Wayne and Judy lived in Carnation in Washington and were extremely liked and popular within the small close-knit community. Together they had three children, Mary, Scott and Michelle. Not much is known about their first daughter Mary apart from that she lived in North Bend. Their son, 32-year-old Scott, was married to 31-year-old Erica Mantle Anderson, and together they had two gorgeous children, 5-year-old Olivia and 3-year-old Nathan. Scott and his family lived about 25 minutes away from his parents, in Black Diamond in Washington. Scott was extremely devoted to his family, and he worked long hours in construction in order to support them. Erica was a stay-at-home mum who cared deeply for her two children. Wayne and Judy's second daughter was 29-year-old Michelle Kristen Anderson. Michelle lived with her boyfriend of five years, 29-year-old Joseph Thomas McEnroe. Michelle and Joseph had met on an online fantasy fiction chat room and they soon moved in together in Full City in Washington in 2004 where they rented a mobile home. On their rental application, Michelle said that she worked as a night security guard at Nintendo and Joseph said he worked at a Target store. Whilst living in this mobile home, it was said that the pair paid their $390 rent on time, but neighbours described them as misfits. One neighbour in particular said that they avoided eye contact and they rarely emerged from their house and that the smallest trespasses, such as a car parked in their spot or a neighbour's cat or child in their yard, would enrage them. Another neighbour said that they were just so bizarre and that Michelle would yell and scream but then calm down and apologise. A third neighbour said that Michelle often brought up the subject of money and that she would say that her parents had quite a lot of money but that she and Joseph were really struggling and very poor. In regards to the dynamic between Joseph and Michelle, the neighbour said that it was obvious that Michelle was in charge and that Joseph looked up to her and that she answered questions for him. Michelle often referred to herself as the black sheep of her family and she and Joseph isolated themselves from everyone else. Michelle said that she had a volatile relationship with her parents and she claimed that her father hit her and that her mother was mean and didn't understand her. Michelle's mother Judy, on the other hand, was worried about her daughter's lifestyle and would often relay her concerns to her best friend Linda. Judy would try and often visit her daughter and Joseph at their mobile home and neighbours said that they saw Judy arrive once a month bearing food and other items. One day, one of Michelle's old school friends called Jennifer Chandler went to visit Michelle and Joseph at their mobile home in Full City. Jennifer said that the mobile home was sparsely furnished and the couple had black material over the windows. When Jennifer asked why, they said that they were sure the neighbours spied on them and that they had tried to break in and that they were basically just out to get them. Jennifer said that Joseph was a little weird and that he had a speech impediment. She said he was always talking about his spirit guide, telling him how to live his life. Jennifer said that during this visit, Michelle had mentioned how she didn't want to move back onto her parents' property. But that did end up happening, and by 2007, Michelle and Joseph moved out of their mobile home in Full City and moved into a trailer 
on her parents' land and started to live rent-free. On the afternoon of the 24th of December, 2007, Christmas Eve, the whole Anderson family were planning to get together to celebrate the Christmas season. Wayne and Judy had invited everyone around, so Scott, along with his wife and their two young children, travelled to the family home in Carnation. Meanwhile, as Wayne and Judy waited for everybody to arrive, Michelle and her boyfriend Joseph, already on the property of the Anderson family home, entered the house at around 4pm. One of them was armed with a revolver, and the other with a handgun. Joseph distracted Judy, who was wrapping Christmas gifts at the back of the house, whilst Michelle approached her father Wayne, and she tried to shoot him. It's unclear whether Michelle's gun jammed, or if she missed, however, so Joseph came back and shot Wayne in the head. Once Wayne was lying on the floor dead, Michelle and Joseph turned their guns on Judy and shot her three times. They then tried to clean up the blood with towels and rugs, and dragged both bodies to a shed behind the house. An hour or so later, at around 5pm, Scott, Erica, and their two children, Nathan and Olivia, arrived at the house, ready to celebrate Christmas with everyone. As Scott and Erica and the kids entered the living room and sat down on the couch, Michelle immediately pulled out her gun and shot her brother Scott multiple times. The murderous pair then turned their sights to Scott's wife, Erica, and started shooting her too. As Michelle ran out of ammunition, Erica, who had been shot three times with bullets, managed to grab the cordless landline and she dialed 911 at 5.13 p.m. Joseph, however, grabbed the phone out of Erica's hands and took the batteries out, throwing the phone against the wall, which abruptly ended the 911 call. With Erica pleading for her life, Joseph then shot Erica in the head, killing her immediately. Joseph then turned to the children, shooting five-year-old Olivia first. Heartbreakingly, little three-year-old Nathan picked up the batteries off the floor and tried to hand them back to Joseph, but an unfazed Joseph just pointed his gun at the young boy and shot him as he was clutching his mother's chest. Following the 911 call made by Erica, the police were sent to the Anderson home to investigate the suspicious call, and they arrived at the property at 5.45pm. Michelle, however, predicted that the police would probably come following Erica's 911 call, so she had gone and locked the front gate that led up to the house at the end of the driveway. According to the dispatcher's log, the deputies reported, gate is locked, unable to gain access, so without any further attempt, the police just turned away and left the house, unknowing of what was inside. Two days later, on the 26th of December 2007, Judy Anderson failed to turn up to work at the United States Post Office in Carnation. Her colleague and friend, Linda Thiel, called her, but there was no answer. Linda immediately felt that something was off, so she drove to the Anderson family home to check on her friend. When Linda arrived at the Anderson property, she was greeted with the locked door, but rather than just turn away like the police had done, Linda decided to go around it to access the house. She then knocked several times on the front door, but there was no answer, so she tried to open the door and it was unlocked. This was strange to Linda, as Judy always kept her house locked. As she pushed the front door open, she peered in and shouted, Judy, it's Linda! Judy, it's Linda! We're worried about you! But there was no response. As she called out, she looked down and saw a man lying on the floor. At first, she thought he had been poisoned with carbon monoxide, so she got ready to try and pull him out the house. But to her absolute horror, she noticed that the man had been shot in the head. And when I stepped over the body, I could see that the body had been shot in the face. She immediately looked around and she saw more victims lying on the floor, so she quickly called 911. 911? Uh, there's been a murder. There's three people dead that I can see right now. Inside? I just came up, she works with me. Inside the house? Yes. What do you see? There's a baby and a man and a woman. And she's my best friend. Law enforcement arrived at the property at around 9.30am that morning, and inside the house, 
they found the bodies of Scott Anderson, his wife Erica Anderson, and their two young children. Three-year-old Nathan was still huddled into his mother's chest for safety, and little five-year-old Olivia was found beneath her mother's body. All four victims had been shot through the head. Law enforcement then found two more bodies hidden in a shed behind the house, and these were the bodies of Judy and Wayne Anderson, and they also had both been shot. A few hours later, at around 11am, Michelle Anderson and her boyfriend, Joseph McEnroe, arrived at the house, but their behaviour immediately struck the detectives as strange. Michelle Anderson told the King County Sheriff detectives she was Wayne and Judy's daughter and lived on the property in a trailer. What detectives found strange was that not once did she or Joseph inquire as to why the officers were there, and she never asked if her family was okay, despite there being yellow police tape across the driveway and yard, as well as dozens of police vehicles, mobile command centres, and uniformed personnel everywhere. Michelle and Joseph never asked what was going on, or why they were not being allowed to return to their home. With Michelle and Joseph's suspicious behaviour, the detectives felt that they were withholding information, so they split Joseph and Michelle up, and questioned them further. Whilst being questioned, both Michelle and Joseph explained how on the 24th of December, they decided to drive to Las Vegas to get married, but they got lost on the way and so they turned back. They both outlined how they had surprised Michelle's parents, Wayne and Judy, with the news of their pending marriage that morning, and that Wayne and Judy had been very happy for them. However, when confronted with their story again, both Michelle and Joseph confessed that this was in fact a cover they had discussed between them, and Michelle immediately broke down and said, What the hell have I done? I'm a monster! After waiving their constitutional rights, both Michelle and Joseph gave lengthy confessions to murdering all six family members. Michelle even led them to where she and Joseph had discarded one of the two guns. In her questioning, Michelle made it very clear to detectives that she had been upset and angry with her brother Scott. She said that she had been very close to her brother until he had gotten married, and she added that Scott supposedly owed her a lot of money. Michelle alleged that she had given her brother Scott money on numerous occasions, and that the last time was years ago, and apparently he owed her a total of around $40,000. She told the detectives that she was upset with her parents too because they would not support her in her conflict with her brother, and she said that she had been slighted and mistreated by her parents. Additionally, she said that her parents were pressuring her to start paying rent for the trailer and the land that Joseph and her had been living on for the last year. When asked directly why she had killed her entire family, Michelle stated that she was tired of everybody stepping on her. She stated that she was upset with her parents and her brother, and if all the problems had not resolved by the 24th of December, then her intent was definitely to kill everybody. When asked specifically about Erica and the children, she stated that it was a combination of not wanting them to have to live with the memories and not wanting there to be any witnesses. Joseph himself later claimed that he killed the children because Michelle had told him to because she herself couldn't do it. They also added that they didn't want the children to grow up having witnessed their parents' death. Later on, in a jailhouse interview, Michelle claimed that she grew up being told that she should have never been born, saying, I told them to stop or I would snap, and they knew what I meant. They just pushed me too far. I just don't know why they had to push me so hard. When detectives asked Michelle how long she'd planned to kill her family, she told them that she had been planning this for two whole weeks. And finally, with all these confessions and reasonings behind the killings, the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office charged Michelle Anderson and Joseph McEnroy with six counts of aggravated murder in the first degree with a firearm on the 28th of December, 2007. Despite the fact that Michelle and Joseph had both confessed to the murders, the process was drawn out for a number of years, costing taxpayers millions of dollars. Ten whole months after the murders, in October of 2008, King County Prosecutor Dan Satterberg said he would seek the death penalty for both of them, saying, Given the magnitude of these alleged crimes, the slaying of three generations of a family, 
and particularly the slaying of two young children, I find that there are not sufficient reasons to keep the death penalty from being considered by the juries that will ultimately hear these matters. However, this received significant pushback from Judge Jeffrey Ramsdell, who ruled against it. The Governor of Washington, Jay Inslee, also said that no one would be executed while he was in office. Around this time, Michelle said in an interview that she wanted to be executed, saying, I need to be executed for everything that I've done. Deciding that I want to die was the most difficult decision I've ever had to make, and I was able to make it without a second thought, because I know what I've done, and I want to take responsibility for it. I'm a different kind of person. Life in prison is not enough punishment for me. I want the most severe punishment, which would be the death penalty. I want to waver my trial. More years passed, and on the 5th of September 2013, the Washington State Supreme Court overturned Judge Ramsdell's ruling regarding the death penalty and ordered that the trials of Joseph and Michelle go ahead and that the death penalty would be on the cards. This must have scared Michelle, as she then took back everything she had previously said and had desired to be executed, and once her new legal team was appointed, her new lawyer, Stephen Ela said, now that the prosecutor has decided to seek the death penalty, Miss Anderson and her defence team will fight to save her life. And so, both Joseph and Michelle were both to be tried separately almost seven and a half years after the murders took place. Joseph McEnroy finally stood trial in January of 2015. The defence claimed that Joseph had been coerced to kill by his former girlfriend, Michelle Anderson, whom he said wanted her family dead. Jurors heard a taped interview that Michelle Anderson had given to a King County Sheriff's detective about the fatal shootings, and during the interview, she insisted the killings were all of her idea. She said, I pushed him into it. We both felt really bad. I should have walked away from it. I take 100% responsibility for it. Joseph claimed that Michelle had moulded him into an attack dog, and he told jurors she did everything she could, every angle, and every way to convince him to kill her family. His lawyer said he was susceptible to her coercion because of his struggles with mental illness and his supposed fragile mental state. What did you do to try to stop this, Joe? I can't even say now. I tried everything that I could. His attorney asked him why he didn't just leave. Well, why not just walk out the door and leave? I couldn't do that. Joseph's aunt, Mary Turner, testified about her nephew's chaotic upbringing and claimed that Joseph was the son of a mentally and economically unstable mother. She said that his mother beat him, verbally abused him, and used him to manipulate her own parents for money. During his testimony, Joseph said that he killed Olivia and Nathan because, in his words, if they weren't already corrupted, they would be by this. The only decent thing to do was to free them. At least they didn't suffer, he said. At least nobody suffered. The way that it is, at least nobody suffered. Finally, on the 25th of March, 2015, the jury came back with guilty verdicts on all six counts, including the aggravated circumstances and firearm enhancements. At sentencing, however, Joseph's defence continued to paint him as a mentally ill man who had been manipulated by his girlfriend. McEnroe, M-C-E-N-R-O-E. -E. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm terrible. Um, I'm sorry, I did because I thought I had to. And yeah, I know that's not a very good excuse, but it's... I'm not trying to excuse myself, I'm just trying to explain my actions. Joseph appeared to be heavily medicated on the stand, and he even almost broke down a few times. Joe, how often do you think about killing the Andersons? <gasps> it's in my mind all the time. King County Senior Deputy Prosecutor Scott O'Toole accused Joseph of changing his demeanour, physical appearance, and even his speech patterns in order to elicit sympathy from the jurors. I've also taken from them, them from these people who had done nothing but shown me kindness and goodness. And if I thought that holding myself or killing myself or doing anything 
that anything I could do would go off and bring back these people or ameliorate the pain or something I would. He then urged the jurors to commend him to death and said the punishment was just. He said, what Joseph McEnroy has done literally changes and destroys history. You will never know what the future might have been. This defendant, Joseph McEnroy, destroyed them for all time. In the end, however, as the jurors could not come to a unanimous decision, with eight to four in favor of death, Joseph McEnroy was sentenced to life without parole on the 13th of May, 2015. Eight years after the murders, Michelle Anderson's trial finally began in January of 2016. While Michelle initially faced the possibility of execution for the killings, King County Prosecutor Dan Satterberg took the death penalty back off the table after two different juries declined to impose death sentences in two other capital murder cases in the past year. And one of those cases was against Joseph McEnroy. So today I am announcing my decision to withdraw the notice of intent to seek the death penalty in the case of State versus Michelle Anderson. The jury in the trial of Michelle Anderson's accomplice, Joseph McEnroe, heard all of the evidence in that case and they found him guilty. And because the jury was unable to unanimously agree that the death penalty was warranted, the result for him is a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole, which is the only other sentence under Washington law. To proceed with the death penalty against defendant Anderson, in light of the sentence imposed on defendant Macromo, would not be in the interest of justice. We have fought long and hard in court to preserve the option of the death penalty for the McEnroe jury. And I measure our success in the fact that the jury did ultimately have this option, even though they could not unanimously agree. But now, faced with the trial for Ms. Anderson, an accomplice whom we allege is equally culpable for the crimes, we must take the steps to equalize the potential punishment that she faces. During this trial, Michelle cried and hung her head at times, but she declined to address the court. Her defense attorney, Colleen O'Connor, said that Michelle Anderson was very remorseful and apologized to everyone involved. Prosecutor Scott O'Toole, on the other hand, said in his opening sentence that the motive for these murders was pure, unadulterated greed. He said this in reference to the initial interview Michelle had had with the detective, in which she brought up money more than 35 times in her explanation as to why she killed her family. The jurors heard more recordings from this interview, and Michelle contradicted herself several times. She went from calling herself a monster and a bad person for murdering her family, to then saying her mother, father, and brother had apparently abused her over the years. She said, I wanted my mum, brother, and dad to die because they abused me over the years. I wasted my life because of these assholes. It's not fair. I just wanted to add that no evidence that Michelle Anderson was abused by her family was ever presented publicly. Everyone described Wayne, Judy and Scott as warm, kind people and that Erica and her children were similarly blameless. During Michelle's trial, it was also revealed that Michelle had hated Erica because she felt that Erica had pushed her out of her brother's life and had created a wedge between them. Prosecutor Scott O'Toole said, Erica was the person that Michelle Anderson truly, truly hated. Erica supplanted Michelle Anderson in the life of her brother. Michelle's attorneys did not call a single witness to the stands during her trial, citing how difficult she had been refusing to cooperate or communicate with them for years. Family members of the victims, however, did take the stand and they addressed Michelle directly. Erica's mother, Pam Mantle, told Michelle, when you shot her, she called 911 not just to save herself, but to save her babies, because she knew you'd kill them too. I don't think you're big and tough, Michelle. I think you're a bully and a coward. I am broken-hearted. Every day I miss those six people. Michelle's older sister, Mary Anderson, told her sister that she would have plenty of time in prison to think about her crimes, adding, It kills me. I loved you so much. Just know they loved you. At the end, the judge commended the secondary victims, which included the relatives, friends, first responders, witnesses, and jurors who had heard horrific testimony and viewed gruesome crime scene photos, commending them all for honoring the memories of the six lives cut short. He said, you have all suffered tremendous losses. Fortunately, this lengthy chapter of your nightmare is almost over. As the trial was wrapping up, Michelle Anderson yelled at the judge, 
telling him she was going to file charges against her court-appointed attorneys, whom she was convinced had been lying to her. She said she temporarily wanted to leave jail and find her own private counsel, but she was not granted permission to do so, and because of this, she blamed Judge Ramsdell, who she said was violating her rights. But finally, on the 4th of March 2016, just like her ex-boyfriend, Michelle Anderson was convicted of six counts of aggravated murder in the first degree, and on the 21st of April, she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And so, as the judge said, with this chapter of a nightmare almost coming to an end, the family finally faced some sort of justice, eight long years after the murders occurred. I don't think we'll ever really know what Michelle's true motive was, whether it was anger, jealousy or money, or everything combined. One thing is certain, however, is that both Michelle and Joseph were just two truly evil individuals. I myself do personally believe that Michelle had some sort of obsession with money, she often brought up this subject to other people. It was said that after the murders, Joseph's mother claimed that she had not heard from her son for nearly five years. This was because, the last time she had spoken to Joseph, he was angry that she had damaged his credit by being evicted from an apartment that he had helped her lease. Joseph had apparently then told Michelle, and Michelle was very angry with his mother too, and both Joseph and Michelle said that because of this bad credit, it was now preventing them from renting a new apartment, and following this incident, Joseph never called his mother again. This obsession with money, fueled with the jealousy towards Michelle's brother's wife, Erica, alongside the resentment she had towards her parents, just turned Michelle into a rageful, evil person. Maybe Michelle couldn't bear to see the happiness between Scott and Erica, and the beautiful little family they had together. As for Joseph, his part in the murders is incredibly strange, as he seems to have little to no motive. He just went along with what his girlfriend wanted, and selfishly took the lives of three generations of the Anderson family. Overall, this case is just completely heart-wrenching. To have six people murdered in a time that's supposed to be filled of happiness and love, when families are supposed to come together and celebrate and be together. It's completely devastating. At least we know these two monsters will never see the light of day again and will never be released. Joseph is currently imprisoned in the Washington State Penitentiary and Michelle Anderson is currently imprisoned in the Washington Correction Center for Women and thankfully, they will never, ever be released. As always, my heart goes out to everyone who was impacted by this horrendous crime, and in particular to Mary, who lost her whole family in just one day. Her parents, her brother, her sister-in-law, and her niece and nephew. And as always, I just want to finish off by saying, rest in peace, Judy, Wayne, Scott, Erica, Olivia, and Nathan. Mm -hmm.